Okay, good morning everyone. Um, firstly, thanks very much for having me. It's, uh, I would like to say I've probably traveled the furthest to be here, um, but it's, it's great to be here. Um, I just want to confirm what Musa is saying in terms of especially that book, Crazy Like Us. It is definitely spread. Um, so we, we're experiencing a lot of the things that uh, you have been sharing. And so I think mine's just to show you that even in the developing world <laughs> and across the sea, a lot of the things that you're experiencing, we're experiencing. Um, I think it's also mutated and we shared the love and sent it back in other <laughs> forms like, like the roads must fall and so forth. Um, I thought this was actually quite a nice quote to start with. Um, these are actually two colleagues um, at Stellenbosch University who who actually wrote a commentary. We had um, a conference where there were Israeli colleagues who were going to come and they were made to feel so very uncomfortable that they, they actually didn't come. And these are two colleagues who, who wrote a commentary about it. Um, and I've just adapted their words somewhat, but it's still, the meaning is there. And they said, academic freedom has become the preserve of those who are in agreement. And I think that really summarizes a lot of what we were seeing. Oh, yeah. So I am a political scientist, so I can't help but look at this with my one eye looking towards democracy. Um, and I think this has much broader ramifications than just academic freedom. And so I would put the academic freedom as a canary in the mind for what is happening in democracy in the world. Um, it was Samuel Huntington, those of you in political science will know Samuel Huntington, who said that freedom and democracy are, are closely linked. And I think if freedom is going to decline, uh, democracy is going to decline. And, and so I, one of the big you know, questions in our field is, is, is democracy in, in regress? And I would actually argue that it's liberty and freedom that's regressing and, and it's taking democracy, democracy with it. Um, so I also I think I'm in agreement with what many are saying that the seeds of destruction are coming from within the ac academy themselves. So um, I would, yeah, interesting what you said, but I would have put it with the social sciences um, and and emanating into the sciences. But it's interesting that you you noted it came the other way around. But definitely it's coming from within the academia, and I would also argue from the media as well as uh, the disseminators of ideas and going into society and, and changing and filtering into society. Um, so I also agree that it's a shift in culture and um, Eric Kaufman and I, we never discussed this, but I wanted to actually speak about your idea of the left modernism, because um, I think it's definitely ideological <coughs> in its roots. I think it's a shifting in cultures, it's a shifting in norms, a shifting in values. Um, that is then obviously changing then the context, but I would argue that it's left postmodernism. Then, then we haven't fully discussed it. Then, then left <coughs> left modernism, um, because I see lots of the absurd more than than the science that's coming through, and and it's very difficult to argue with the absurd, um, and uh, to build any kind of argumentation around it. Um, so I also wanted to show you this this. Uh, some of you might know Ron, Ronald Inglart, um, really one of the key political scientists in our field, and he wrote a book called Cultural Evolution. And he argues, and this comes when the, the bohos, is it bohos? Bobo, bobos. bobos, which was an interesting <laughs> concept, which I'm going to take back with me. Um, but the bobos, and he actually argues that, that when, when societies become safe, and so he's arguing that the West has grown in terms of, of peace and in terms of its economy and and this allows them to move from materialist um, focus to a post-materialist focus. So environmental in issues, gender issues, race issues, um, identity issues. So he actually, this could be an argument as to why we seem to see it more in the middle class and, and the bourgeoisie and these ideas coming from them is these post-materialist ideas. Um, the problem I have with it is that I come from a context of inequality and uh, poverty um, and unemployment and these ideas are very much so rife in, in my context as well. It's certainly not what one would call a safe context by, by, any, by any means. Um, so that's why I would argue that it's more actually ide ideological that is happening and these ideas are, are, being, are being permeated through society. So just to give you a context, the thing is as well with the South African context is that these ideas have a lot more resonance, actually, I would say, in South Africa because there is a lot more um, reason for it. 
Uh, so we, we genuinely do have a racialized history. Uh, we, we genuinely do have inequalities. And, um, and so it's really, these ideas have come and found enormously fertile ground in South Africa and um, are serving to, to just re-radicalize and re-racialize our society. Which, um, although I want to point out the differences when I, it's interesting when you speak about minorities and that it's obviously a completely different context for us, where um, it's inverted, where, where, where minorities are, we are the, still considered to be the white supremacists, but we sit in about 7% of the population um, and we have affirmative action. Um, but again, it's the, the reverse way of affirmative action um, with 7% of the population. Um, so a racialized history of obviously apartheid, um, it's that scapegoat that never stops giving. Um, you can always lean on it at any stage um, and for any reason. And unfortunately, much is then deflected and shown, okay, this is, this is why it happened and this is what's going on. And, you know, we didn't have 10 years of state capture. It's definitely, we're going to have to trace it back somewhere. Um, um, but unfortunately, we do have a racialized history. We do have a history of white supremacy. We do have a history where, where whites really dominated, suppressed. Um, so it's, there's an enormous amount of credibility in the <coughs> arguments and the legitimacy. So it also serves to silence um, many, though, who would want to argue on different points. But just by your whiteness, it, it becomes problematic. And there's also another side in terms of the racializing, is, and that's the Africanism with ideas like pan-Africanism. And many also actually <coughs> came from, from America and also again found fertile soil in the early um, liberation movement. And that's ideas of Africa just for black Africans, um, not for, for, for anyone else. Um, we also have, and this is something I, have, I think we, you, you touched on, Heather, but we actually see a lot more is, is violence. <coughs> Um, so a lot of it translates into to violence and we're not becoming a less violent, we're becoming a, a more violent society and the acceptability of violence. So when I lecture, I find it's interesting where before I could accept the norm democracy and I realize that every, think everybody's on the same boat, I don't feel the same in the classroom anymore. That democracy is not a norm that is just accepted. I have to explain <coughs> why democracy is important, why democracy is good. I mean, in the same way, I also have to explain why violence is not good for democracy. And I can feel the tension when I speak about that transition period and actually how it was a good thing that we, 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 we didn't go into civil war and that, that violence will destabilize the system. But so this also translates into the way the engagement happens on the campuses as well as it moves into violence. And so this history of violence with apartheid, the People's War, strong communist influence, also all the way from Vietnam, the idea of uh, that everybody's part of the, part of the, the struggle and um, nobody's allowed to be outside the struggle. And we saw this on the campuses as well. Those who didn't want to join, they were victimized, um, they were intimidated, they were told to come in and so this has this history very strong communist history i think we have a moderating force and um, so i want to bring a bit of religion in and um, so i do study also the religion and politics and i would actually say that our missionary history has actually created a very moderating force in south africa that's why people really can't get their hands on the anc because it has so many different ideas that have fed into it and this has created also a core of liberal democrats and the ideas of liberty are still there and they're enshrined in our constitution. So our constitution, we have a Bill of Rights and inside that Bill of Rights um, is freedom of expression and inside that is freedom of academic freedom. So part of our history also recognizes <coughs> these are important freedoms and they are enshrined in our, in our very constitution. The other thing which dominates South Africa, which I think is, is a little bit more different is because of this history is we have a transformation agenda that's happening. Um, again, there's legitimacy to it in light of our history. So there has to be an element of transformation, but it's the approach of how do you transform. So I am um, in my normal PC-ness, um, I, I have to cite where I got that term nativist, at least I'm accused of, of things. Um, that actually comes from a colleague, um, Ned Lachana, and he actually, he analyzed the public sector and the transformation of the public sector in terms of a, a universalist approach, and that would be in line with our constitution that everybody's equal, everybody should have a fair chance in terms of, of gaining access to the jobs and actually creating a fairer system. But then there's also the nativist approach, which is really interesting. This is that 
the idea, the normative idea that if you put people of the same skin color, they are going to represent your interests better. So, and this is also coming into the universities. So he actually traced it in the public sector, which has been completely transformed, if you want to talk about transformation in terms of, of, of race. And yet we went through 10, 10, 10 years of state capture. So it, it falls <coughs> apart. So the nativist idea is we're going to put black people in, sorry, we're very racialized, so we, we just use these terms all the time, into, into the public sector, they will look after each other. And that, that certainly didn't happen. But this is what is happening inside the universities, is that many are taking a nativist approach um, in terms of staff complement, in terms of quotas, in terms of students, student access, and now in terms of the curriculum. So we have uh, the decolonization, um, you know, which we have been told to decolonize our, our curricula. Um, it'll be interesting to see how that looks. Um, I do want to say, though, that um, these ideas, again, what we've found, and I think this has come through, is that the ideas that are coming out of the academia don't necessarily resonate with the general population. So um, there was this, I just wanted to show you this in terms of how do South Africans view, in terms of that, that nativist versus the universalist approach. Universalist, one would expect, would be on a basis of, of merit. Um, and, and you see that across board, South Africans actually largely believe that, that the best person should be given the job um, regardless of race. And I've just turned my presentation off. <laughs> <laughs> I just got, self, it's self-censorship. You, know? <laughs> you did a good job. <laughs> um, and then, Okay, I don't want to touch it again. So you can, so you'll see that that agrees about 87% say that you know jobs should be irrespective of race, and that even across board, um, understandably so, less so with, with with black Africans and more so with with our minority groups. So, coloured or mixed race, Asian and white, um, obviously saying it should be on the basis of merit. But it, but there's a general consensus that all positions should be given on the basis of merit. Um, and then this is obviously in terms of just again giving quite a, a good idea that there's, there's very little aptitude for, for this partisan approach or this nativist approach or Africanist approach or, um, and, and in fact that, that's why I'd argue again that's actually coming out of the, the academia. Okay, so again, look, appointments should be made on merit with special training, and that's a 70%. And those um, only black people until those are employed are democratic. Demo demographically representative is only about 5.8 percent. What are we seeing in South Africa in terms of um, concerns for academic freedom? I think the one is, um, and there are later legislations that have been passed, but the Higher Education Act, so we see centralized state control, which came in in 1997. Again, this comes with our ruling party, the African National Congress, which has a very strong history of of, of communist history from the 1960s, which has really imbued a culture inside the ANC of centralized control. So they, as much as they try, they, I mean, they don't succeed in everything, but they would really like to centrally control everything. Um, and this comes to the education as well. So it's as given, as opposed to parliamentary oversight, now it's, it's oversight by the Minister of Education, <laughs> who, who has enormous powers over the universities themselves and puts pressure on the universities, especially around transformation and the transformation agenda. We saw, this is, um, if anyone is interested, uh, there were two academics who wrote about what happened at one of our, our used to be fairly good universities, um, in KwaZulu-Natal, um, where the vice chancellor was appointed less in terms of the rules than on the terms of a native approach to race approach, which is interesting is actually it was the students that motivated, moved it and demanded his appointment. Um, and they actually capitulated to them. So it was the SRC, SASCO, which is the student movement, which emanates from the ANC. And they had him and he then started a vilification campaign against all those uh, white and Indians, anyone of, of any of the minority groups. And many left and has really left a hollowed out institution. And um, some colleagues from there actually uh, documented it in that book, The Struggle for the Soul of a South African University. Then my own personal experience was with the protests, intimidation and violence and that spread across all our campuses from 2015 to, to 2016. <coughs> and I will go into this in more detail. 
Um, so I will leave that for now. Disinvitations. So UCT, University of Cape Town, which would be considered, uh, is considered to be our best university and the best university in South Africa. Um, they disinvite Fleming Rose uh, from giving its TB Davy academic freedom lecture, which was really interesting. Um, <laughs> And the argument given by the then Vice Chancellor Max Price for this was um, he didn't want to create a, a place where people didn't feel safe. So he was argument was on the basis of safe spaces. Um, then my, my university 2018 was the one I referred to where Israeli scholars withdrew from the conference. I do want to say that, that our authorities certainly did not disinvite them but um, they felt sufficiently unwelcome that they didn't, didn't come. I think they received a number of threats from, from colleagues, from academics themselves, um, and a, a lobby group against them. Okay, then there are also taboo subjects and trial by media and activists, and this is something which is playing out at our university right now, where um, colleagues in the, the sports sciences wrote an article which was published it's called Age and Education Effects on Cognitive Functioning in Coloured South African Women. I'm not sure if any of you are following this, you're following it. Um, and they, they, um, they actually, the, the journal which was uh, Aging Neuropsychology Psychology and Cognition, a journal on normal and dysfunctional development, actually withdrew, so Taylor and Francis article, they withdrew they withdrew the article um, what was happening was, and this is interesting, it was a, a, from UCT, a colleague, a professor in English literature studies who was commenting on a science and cognitive functioning and argued that they were racist and that they were actually calling all colored women um, dumb, which showed an inability to understand what cognitive functioning actually means. Um, or t and, and because of this, this lobbying group, they lobbied the, the journal and um, they were actually compelled and they had, had the article retracted. There's now a, a massive smear campaign. The, unfortunately, all the writers of the article are, are, are white women um, and it's, they're considered to be, be racist and now we wait to see if they will have their jobs in, in, the, in the future at Stellenbosch University. So Nicole, can you just explain, was it retracted under normal publishing guidelines to <laughs> falsify data? Yeah, so, so I actually also contacted Taylor and Francis myself and asked, asked on what basis did you do this? And they said that together with the authors, I would like to go and find out um, that it was retracted because the authors um, said their methodology was not sound. So I think that the, if there was one problem <coughs> is they generalized. They had a very small sample and I think they generalized. There was one sentence in which they generalized and I think if they, they could be at fault, that's where their fault lies. But in terms of the methodology, and, and so they actually argued as a journal that it was the methodology that was problematic. The reality is, is this is actually more symptomatic of the nativist approach. White scholars cannot write on anyone else except for white. The problem in South Africa is that you don't get any funding um, unless you are investigating or doing work with, with disadvantaged, uh, previously disadvantaged communities. Um, so the uh, fees must fall student protests it started in 2015. <coughs> They started at Witwatersrand, so these would be our, considered to be our top universities in terms of these would be our research universities. Um, WITS and UCT, University of Cape Town, so Fees Must Fall came from, from WITS, UCT was a Rose Must Fall. Uh, these are actually your progressive liberal universities. These were the, uh, the, the bane for the apartheid states. They were highly critical of apartheid. They, um, yeah, so liberal left-leaning universities and yet still the protests um, emanate out of them. The key issue was grievances or was around fees um, and access to university. And I think this is what you also need to understand is that for many jobs is related to a university degree. So employment, where we have about 40% unemployment, if you have a university degree, you, you have an 80 to 90% chance of employment. So it's high stakes to get into university. And unfortunately, the expectations are universities that we are there to fix 12 years of bad education. And if they don't, then the problem is ours. Um, so we have the student fees, we have language, Stellenbosch University is open, Stellenbosch, Stellenbosch University is a historically Afrikaans speaking university with um, rather dubious history in terms of, and I don't want to say it because it's a really excellent university, um, I would say it's perhaps the best, um, except for our history. 
And um, so unfortunately, we don't have the liberation credentials, um, but we have a history with these links in terms of apartheid. And so open Stellenbosch <coughs> was, was a move to remove Afrikaans as a language at Stellenbosch University, and then also the ideas of decolonize, decolonization. Um, so in 2015, it was interesting, the actors were actually cross race, class and political affiliation. There was a sense that, that everyone wanted everyone to have access to education and wanted fairness. Um, but then what we saw is that in 2016, it completely shifted to being polarized along racial lines. It was radicalized. Um, I don't know if you can see this, but this is the economic freedom fighters. They are, um, are self-described as a militant Marxist radical left-wing party. And when I have asked them um, and their representatives if in the long term they ever won, would they want multi-party democracy? The answer was no, we want a one-party state. Um, so this is, this is communism in its, in its purest form. And they came into the protests and they really garnered a lot of support on the campuses. And, and in our recent elections, we can start to see that they're <coughs> growing. So they bring these radical ideas in as well. So um, and finding fertile ground and then a move towards hate speech, intimidation and irrationalism. So my vilification credentials are really nothing in comparison to what I've heard here. But I went to one of their talks with some colleagues. We went to go and listen. And I explained to my colleagues, this is not the moment that you speak, you just listen, we're going to sit here quietly. But obviously, they were looking for a spectacle, and I arrived, and so I made the moment, and all of a sudden, I was drawn into something I had no expectation for. They put the rules up for engagement. The rules was that everybody could have a chance to speak, everybody's opinion counted. Rule number two was that, first of all, it was black and women that would be able to speak. Um, and so when they, the first student then, pointed to me and said, you didn't teach us sufficiently about Steve Biko in South African politics. Um, and he's from obviously the leader of the Black Consciousness Movement. So I just kept quiet. I know you're not supposed to respond. You just keep quiet. The next student then pointed and said, why did you smirk when she said that? And then I felt compelled. I needed to say something. I said, look, I am the editor of a South African politics book. And my whole point of the book was to bring in diversity. You will see this diversity of ideas. Um, in terms of worldviews and in terms of race um, and uh, gender and everything. And then the next thing, the next one said is because um, uh, one, one of the authors is Lelo Monku, and he is actually an expert in terms of the black conscious movement, Steve Biko, and his chapter's there. And I use his chapter. And the next student then put up a hand and said, but who do you think you are to be an interpreter of, of black, black voices? <laughs> So it's again that nativist approach where, where we cannot speak except on behalf of whites, but we're not allowed to speak either. So real irrationalism. I want to show you some of these speeches and things that came out around that time. So in an interview with the Rose Must Fall activist, the question was, so how binding are the agreements the university reaches with you? The answer, when the university publishes the agreement public, Lead, that is a form of binding themselves. So there's no mutual reciprocity. There's only a demanding from the one side, but there's no mutual. And this is what we saw actually with the university's experience with the protest, that every time an agreement was made, they would break the agreement. Um, and they felt no need to, to agree to and, and then, then honor those agreements. Um, another one, rogue, <coughs> my body is political, my existence is violent. Radical black trans feminists, not here to make my body and psych available for violence. I'm not sure how those two connect. Um, and then this is from Fees Must Fall. African child, the enemy of capital, Marxist scholar, a minor by choice, by his grace, I'm still standing. So we also have a highly religious society, so that also gets drawn, drawn into to, to it. Okay, so... My argument is that we're seeing, and I think this really kind of, I'm just echoing what many have already said, is a cultural shift in terms of norms and values from the idea of, of a universalism, a, a universal common identity as humans, where there's equal recognition just on the basis of, of your human value towards a special recognition um, on terms of your group identity. And um, the move from the individual um, as that first port of call in terms of society to collective and groups and um, move from the value of freedom. And this is what I say also relates to interesting uh, perceptions or ideas 
um, <laughs> and notions around democracy instead of that intrinsic idea of freedom, intrinsic idea of democracy as an environment where you have procedural rules, civil liberties, political liberties, to an equality of outcome, a materialist understanding. This is definitely something we're seeing in South Africa, a materialist understanding of democracy. Democracy must give me something. Um, in our case, it's jobs, food, water, housing, and so forth. Um, a move from discussion and debate to disruption and silencing, um, from logic and rationality in science to emotive um, argumentation, sentiment, objective truth to post-truth. And I think this is interesting for me because I keep hearing that a university is, is the, the part of the, 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 the rationale behind a university is to seek out truth. But if you, there is no truth to seek out, I'm not sure what we're doing. Um, so post-truth, myth-making, um, and I think this is also key from broad norms where it allows for tolerance and acceptability and that um, what, what Nigel was speaking about, the, those, those broad norms which allows for diversity inside of it to very special interests. And the special interests will come in conflict, especially around religious interests. And this is why, why we're finding that conflict where, where broad norms of we agree to disagree, we agree to have an environment of civility where you say what you want to say, but I don't have to agree with you and you don't have to agree with me to we will, you will not conform to what we say. And these are the new norms and these are the new values. But unfortunately, there's such big incompatibility, especially when it comes to religious values and norms. And that's why I see we think we're seeing a lot of um, intransigence that that inability to to compromise. And the academics and use of journals, argumentation, I think what we're seeing is academics are becoming activists as opposed to academics. Um, and then the uh, use of social media. So a lot of the um, attacks on colleagues is through social media, <coughs> that trial by Twitter. Um, and so I, I, I see the consequences instead of truth seeking, trust an environment of good faith and collegiality and pluralism it's moving to post-truth, distrust, po bad faith, that, that you automatically assume the negative of the other side, polarization, and then compelled conformity. And we see this in terms of what we've spoken about as well, like in, at, for our universities, the equality unit, transformation unit, where we are compelled and there's training, sensitivity training that's happening throughout. And this also came after the, the, um, the protests as well. I actually had a quote from maybe when we have the questions, I can find it in terms of the rationale behind our equality unit. Um, but it's, it's really, many of us are uh, talking about, it's, it's more like the thought police that are now on campus in terms of what we're allowed to say, how we say it. And then if we're not saying it properly, like those, um, that entire department where that journal article came from, they are now going through this process where they have to have the sensitivity training and, um, and so forth. So, so why? Okay, I've, wrap it up. yeah. Wrap it up. Wrap it up. Wrap it up. Sorry. So why? So I just again, I think it's ideologies in South Africa. It's that nativist approach, the strong influence, historical influence of Marxism. Um, what's important, and I thought this would be interesting. We have talked that this has come from a history, but Antonio Gramsci's war of position, where he actually said, he argued that if you're going to change the society, you have to shape the will, a new collective will. And that's that hegemony of ideas and a transplanting of one hegemony of ideas to another. And, I, and he said that it should be through the universities, through the media. And this is exactly what, what, is, what is happening. And the Frankfurt School, and this moves down, obviously critical theory, the gender study shift from equality to special group recognition, the left shift from class to culture, and then um, I had to put that in, but a post-Judaic Christian culture, which we can, we can unpack where the idea of, of individual is transplanted to identity based on collective. What now? And... Um, I think we need to equip and engage, and we have a world views group. There's a couple of us colleagues where we are actually drawing in younger students, and we, we have been following a lot of what you have been up to. We've been following this, discussing it, and arguing what we can do. Um, and the point is, I think, 
that something when like Jordan Peterson's being very liberating when someone has spoken out and then other people go, oh my goodness, other people think like this. I'm not alone. And so what we do is we try and equip them that they can put their hand up. And so we also do, we try and go to discussions, we put our hands up and we say, well, what about this? Just to give others the idea and the freedom to also be able to have different thoughts and different ideas. Um, I think we have to ensure there's ideological diversity by remaining in the academia, in our research, in our teaching and in media. One of the areas I'd like to look at is social cohesion what is happening with identity politics and social cohesion so that's where i would like to have a look we need to network and not just in the academia but i know for us we have other think tanks which which have similar more conservative ideas and then uh, teach argumentative writing i mean i started to bring this back i thought this was everyone understood this but we had to bring it back i'm doing it on an honors level we actually have to teach that you actually have to have an argument which is backed up with data you have to recognize that there are counter arguments and then you have to make the links between them um, so i'm just bringing those basics back and just to show that there are movements which are countering this, this is at uct's is a, they're called progress they're not just for black but they're also saying that blacks can also be conservative um, and they're doing fabulous work. And then this is Big Daddy Liberty. He, he goes around, does these talks. He's, he's an absolute classical liberal. Um, he's just converted to Judaism. And um, he's really, he, yeah, and he's really big and he, he, he loves it. And, he, and he's, yeah, he's really doing fabulous work. Okay.